Sabo Naval Base in Japan, the undersea boats of Japan's once mighty navy are lined up for their last voyage. Among the submarines is the I-58, which sank the United States cruiser Indianapolis just a few days before Japan surrendered. The 24 submarines, unfit for salvage, are loaded with charges of high explosives. The largest one of this group had deck hangar space and catapult for four airplanes, but the surrender came before they could be used. From Sasebo, the submarines head for the open sea and the end of the road. 60 miles off the Japanese coast, the cruiser Chicago and other United States naval craft stand by to blast the doomed ships. In deep water, Japan's former terror raiders are sunk beyond all hope of reclaim. insecticide that helped prevent epidemics in war-torn Europe and the Pacific areas goes to work in an American community. Trucks go out to spray an entire county in the state of Georgia. Center of the gigantic health campaign is the town of Columbus, which plans to become the cleanest city in the country. Cleanup crews also go into action. Rubble and refuse disappear. the area. Over 20,000 homes, dairies, restaurants, and stores are visited by the sprayers, armed with large quantities of the DDT insecticide. A former army officer who handled the same sort of job on Okinawa and in Korea is in charge of the project. No corner of the area escapes the DDT spray. Center of a Canadian gold rush is the town of Yellowknife in the province of Alberta. The town is swarming with gold hunters and new businesses. The Canadian government is urging its returning war veterans to blaze new trails in Canada's great northwest. This little town was booming when the outbreak of war put a temporary end to gold mining. Up to the war, these mines had produced considerable of the valuable metal. <laughs> Gold mines on new claims use a diamond drill going down perhaps 800 feet. The drill comes out of the depths and brings up samples of the gold-bearing ore. The ore is smelted and liquid gold poured into a mold. Ingots of the precious metal have lured thousands to the Yellowknife fields. gold has been the foundation of dozens of small businesses which are growing with the town. 2,000 square miles of gold fields, newly discovered, has brought in more and more people with the pioneering spirit, ready to face the hard, rugged life in Canada's Northwest. Stretching for many miles in the state of Florida are the great cypress swamps of the Everglades. Though insect-ridden and treacherous with quicksand, they're a valuable source of a valuable commodity, cypress lumber, especially important today in view of the shortage of housing materials. Lumbermen braving the almost impenetrable swamps must first build a railroad to get the logs out. Axes and saws bit into trees 2,000 years old, and 20 tons at a time, the cypress come crashing down. Working often in water hip deep, the loggers provide huge quantities of lumber a year. Riding across the swamp, the tough, rot-proof cypress heads for the lumber mill, 28 carloads at a time. The world's most difficult logging operation provides lumber for badly needed homes. The 
family home of Franklin Delano Roosevelt at Hyde Park, New York, becomes the property of the people of the United States on the first anniversary of President Roosevelt's death. As the nation and the world recall a fateful day, President Truman and Mrs. Roosevelt pay homage at the fallen leader's grave. April 1945, the war in Europe was drawing to its close, but all America was shocked and saddened, for Franklin Roosevelt was dead. Roosevelt Estate is formally dedicated to the public. Crowds of people have come for the ceremony. Trigby Lee, Secretary General of the United Nations, and Russian delegate Andrei Gromyko are present to pay their respects. The late president's faithful dog, Fala, sits at the feet of his mistress. Mrs. Roosevelt turns over the property, which will become a national shrine, to the American people. It was the people, all of the people of this country and of the world, whom my husband loved and kept constantly in his mind and heart. He would want them to enjoy themselves in these surroundings and to draw from them rest and peace and strength as he did all the days of his life. Mr. President, I am happy that you could be with us on this occasion. And to you, Mr. Secretary, I now turn over the full possession of the land, the house with its content, the other buildings, which my husband willed to the people of the United States. Before the large audience, which includes many government leaders, President Truman pays tribute to the late president. Here where he was born, in the spot which he loved best in the world, he is now at rest. We shall not soon see his like again. May Almighty God, who has watched over this republic as it grew from weakness to strength, give us the wisdom to carry on in the way of Franklin D. Roosevelt. The reception room of the 120-year-old Roosevelt home is filled with worn and comfortable furniture, just as it was when he lived. In the library is the desk at which the late president liked to work on his stamp collections in the evenings. From the main hall, the old carved stairway leads to the room in which Franklin Roosevelt was born. 